You're listening to Wastoids. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is, therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? Well, it's whatever you need it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work or not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. As a special offer to Waste Toys listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash wastoids. That's betterhelp.com slash wastoids. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Everybody, it's the Spindle Podcast with Mark and John. Welcome to the Spindle, a podcast about seven inch records. I'm Mark. I'm John. And in each episode, we talk about one seven inch record, and hopefully, give you some insight into it that you haven't heard before. We both got into music in the 80s and 90s when seven inches were super important, especially on independent labels. So that's the era we mostly draw from, but we pick stuff earlier or later than that too, sometimes. And either way, we'll try to keep it short and to the point, just like seven inches do. So on this week's episode, we are going to talk about a seven inch by Super Chunk, a slack motherfucker backed with Night Creatures. It was released on the band's own label Merge on April 1st, 1990, recorded January of that year at Duck Key Studios in Raleigh, where the band lived. Uh, the band at that time was uh, Mac McCoggan, Laura Balance. I guess it's Mac on guitar and vocals, Laura Balance on bass, Chuck Garrison on drums, and Jack McCook on the other guitar. And of, uh, not too long after this came out, Chuck and Jack were out of the band, and John Worcester became the drummer, and Jim Wilbur became the guitarist. Um, but for this little brief period of time, that was the band. And uh, this is num- release number seven on Merge, which I was surprised when I looked at. I, for some reason, I kind of figured this would have been one, like, one of the first or second releases. But uh, it's cassettes, right? Then like Angels of Episiotic. I think it is. And stuff. Yeah, this this might be the first seven inch they did. And certainly yeah. the first first record on the label that got a pretty big amount of notice. Um, yeah, it kind of <laughs> launched. It helped. Uh, I was thinking about that. It also helped launch Matador a little bit because Merge immediately made a deal with Matador. Right. Matador probably did a lot of distro for that record and stuff like that. Right. And then the, the first Super Chunk full length was on Matador and had this song on it. I think the exact same recording of the song. Um, I think probably. so. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't think they re-recorded it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so you know, we, uh, the A side of this, this one is a, a pretty awesome and a, a kind of a indie staple about hating your work, hating your boss, hating the people you work with. Uh, I think Mac, who wrote the lyrics, ultimately said it was based on a, someone he worked with at a Kinko's or something like that. It doesn't mean that that's what the song had to be about, basically, I, I don't think. <laughs> well, it's about all of that. And, you know, you can apply it, even though, yeah, it sounds like that's exactly what it's about. But it could be about anybody you have, you're having difficulties with because they're not pulling their weight, you know, it, might be a coworker, might be a boss, might be a friend, it might be a, a lover, perhaps. <laughs> right. Your slack motherfucker lover. Yeah. <laughs> hey. It's yeah. a legitimate criticism. It's true. It's true. Um, you would not want to be a slack lover. That's true. I've never even heard that said. <laughs> even those of us in the 90s who wanted to slack on everything else, even we didn't want to slack on loving people. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so um so the first our first episode was Husker Du and I feel like Super Chunk owes a decent bit to Husker Du. I imagine they were I probably so, yeah. relatively influenced by them the it, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. The guitar sound especially and not the just angry, the sound swarming but, bee guitar sound. Exactly. And just the use of sort of big 
big repetitive chords. Right. I think it's pretty similar. But um, it's got this diminutive Tasmanian devil quality that like Husker do always sounds like, you know, grown men stamping around having a temper tantrum. Uh-huh. Whereas Super Chunk has this more manic kind of wound up quality to them, mm-hmm. sprung sound. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of their vibe. Although they're not sonically the most original band in the world, they do have that kind of unique spin on it because his voice is so high. Mm-hmm. So it's got this, it's sort of Buzz Coxy, but kind of crazier sounding. Right. Yeah, the high voice has a has a big effect on how this song sounds. It's sort of hard to imagine. Right. It's sung by someone else once you've heard it a couple of times. Like Mark um, Lanigan, it, we, we, we just... <laughs> That would it would sound like menacing as shit, you know. Yeah. That would not be a pleasant. You'd totally like, oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's like a threat, right? Absolutely. Which is the interesting thing about this song too, to me, is that it's a sort of an angry, pissed off punk song, but it doesn't. I don't know if I would come around thinking angry. It's 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 energizing, the way they do it. It's more. I don't it's know. It's pretty angry, but I mean, yeah. it's like muttering to yourself while you do the work angry right you're like (laughs) you're like it's like that kind of thing in your head you're screaming it's like the sound that's going on in your head while you continue to stack boxes and whatever right crap job or whatever thing that you're keeping doing you know it might even be momentary A time period where the idea of slackerdom or or yeah. you know or not conforming and not wanting to do a job or not wanting to go nine to five and stuff is pretty big but this isn't this isn't sort of a, a mopey slacker song i don't think it really yeah it's funny because i don't know that i would relate it to that whole slacker thing at all uh per se because it's definitely pejorative here like he's right. he's like come on pull your pull your weight you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I am always impressed that he wasted that hook with the word motherfucker. <laughs> right. Like right. that that if he had not put the word motherfucker in that song, imagine the licensing mm-hmm. potential for a song that just he just could have used any other anything in there other than motherfucker. <laughs> and right. it probably would have worked. Mother right. Trucker. I mean, stupid pop songs have done that. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you might have heard it in stadiums all over the place, but instead. Right. Yeah. I mean, Fugazi's waiting room ended up in stadiums. So this could have yeah. easily too. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And no, I remember reading in the, so there's a book about Merge, sort of the history of Merge that John, a guy named John Cook wrote. And he said in there that Glenn Booth, who was kind of a, a sort of a, North Carolina, I mean, he's still around, but he's, he, I don't think he was their manager or anything, but he had a decent amount to do with the band. And he, he tried to talk them out of making that the A side because of the language, but they were like, who gives a shit sort of, you know, I think also, I don't think they were thinking, well, we got to make it a hit. I mean, they probably didn't care too much well, about that. I mean, they had to think a little bit of college radio airplay. Right. True. I mean, that, that was the only shot you had of, getting it out there is that you had to send it to all the college radio stations who then played it because otherwise who else is going to find out about it and how mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i can't recall like i'm trying to remember because i was just hearing about records at that point and buying them i don't know that i was listening necessarily a bunch of specific radio stations right but um i'm trying to re- i think it, people would just play it and sort of i don't i think it uh, maybe i'm wrong but wait till late at night or something like that i don't know Right. That's what the wiki entry claims that the stations had to wait till like safe harbor period or whatever to play, which might be true. But I mean, I think in college we used to, at least for my college radio experience was 
we were cautious, but if, if somebody ended up playing something, we almost never heard about it from anybody else because not enough people were listening to <laughs> Yeah, like who would complain? That's what I mean. Yeah. But yeah. I could see, though, there's that's one thing to have somebody just sort of say, fuck. It's another thing for it to say slack motherfucker over and over and over again in the song. It's a completely different vibe. It's still, I mean, it, what's funny is it seemed like such a, a sensation. They, I think you would say they've had bigger hits since then than oh, for sure. slack motherfucker. Yeah. Like that sounds almost quaint compared to what they yeah. got into and, yeah yeah and i think they got i mean that from what i've read they got sort of tired of playing it after a while and then they came back to it later years and and it's almost like i think mac had a quote about like we don't really even think about what the song's about anymore it's just so much fun to play and it's fun to have a lot of people yell motherfucker while we're playing right. a song you know <laughs> yeah it's it's a battle you know because it's like on one hand you you listen to the song and you're like imagine if i came up with some other chorus for it on the other hand once you hear that chorus, you have to, you're like, nope, that's it. That's the one, you know, because it sounds, it's so genius, you know, and just screaming that over and over again. And it's a great kind of song because it kind of bumbles along and then all of a sudden it's slack, motherfucker, you know, and then it goes back to, it's kind of, it's really smartly puts the focus on the slack motherfucker part too. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. It's a very rabble rousing kind of single Totally. And, and Slack Motherfucker on, on just sort of the basic level of sound uh, has a really good rhythm to it as a phrase. Yeah, it scans really well. It's very singable. It's it's a musical thing to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> All the, funny way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and in that, in that same book, uh, Mac told a story about how his mom wouldn't send out clippings of the uh, of reviews of it to the family members because of the name of the song. That's pretty funny. Which is, which is pretty awesome. So, yeah, I mean, some of the background with them at the time, I mean, they, they'd been called just Chunk up to right before this. I think they just barely changed the name right before they pressed this record uh, because there was a band called Chunk in New York. So they added Super on. Oh, Chunk, Sam Bennett. That's that Knitting Factory group. Exactly. Right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. that one. And then Chunk was, the name Chunk was taken from the drummer named, named Chuck. Right. His name got listed wrong in the phone book, I guess, as Chunk or something. But then... <laughs> Ironically, he left the band not long after this, and then he started claiming that that Mac had written the song about him, even though he's on the record himself and was there when it was made. But it could be true. Yeah, no, I guess it could. I be. I mean, he could have written the song about the guy who's in the band right now. <laughs> I mean, that's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that wouldn't be the first time that happened. I guess. No. <laughs> but either way, it does. It kind of, you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter for the quality of the song. But it's kind of funny that a. The guy who the the song was named the band was named after thinks that the song was about him. That does seem kind of I don't know. It's, it's not saying something good about yourself. No, it's not. like I would be like, well, nobody would say I was a slack motherfucker. I hope. I mean, <laughs> right, right. That couldn't be about me. Yeah, <laughs> somebody'd have to tap me on the shoulder and go, John. I want to right. talk to you about your slackness. But then I think of you know it is interesting. We haven't brought this up, but the subgenius thing of needing slack. Mm -hmm. So perhaps this is an anti him to Bob Dobbs, sort of this, no, I won't give in to the slack or the slackness. Wow. I didn't even think about that. Now for people who, who aren't as old as us and don't know that reference, the church of the sub genius was like, I don't even know how you would describe it. It was like a satirical, satirical. philosophical, smarty pants, bullshit. Right. Right. Yeah. which is fun it's great yeah oh it is great and the funny thing is even though i bet mac and, and super junk wouldn't say they were referring to it it, it was in the ether oh they, yeah i would say they were yeah i mean everybody was at least you know on that whole underground thing everybody was very much and north carolina at that time had a heck of a scene like right totally super chunk just the tip of the iceberg you know you mm -hmm. had vanilla train wreck and picasso trigger and some other bands like that that were Paulo really really good bands mm -hmm. um all kind of original sounding and having their own vibe 
Yeah, and that's why when you were mentioning earlier that it doesn't really seem to be so so related to the kind of slacker vibe of the 90s is because very much every time I hear it, I think of the scene they were in it was right. much more important than some sort of national thing going on. Per yeah. Say, you know. Um, right, I, right. And well, and it's, you know. it's definitely not a slack song. And, right. You know what I mean? Like, it's very wound up. It's not like, a, you know, I guess you'd say, I like to say a pavement song. Some of the Crooked Rain stuff would be the classic sort of slacker right. vibe. Uh -huh. It's definitely, they always stayed very, like, tight. The Spindle will be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. From cult horror and sci-fi to B-movie splatterfests, to underground music documentaries, concert films, public access shows, indie label showcases and original programs, Night Flight Plus is the coolest place online for weird and riveting viewing. Right now, Wastoids listeners can get $10 off an annual membership. That means access to Night Flight's library for only $29.99 a year. Head to www.nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and enter Wastoids in all caps. That's W-A-S-T-O-I-D-S. Enter promo code Wastoids at nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and get back in the days. And now back to the show. Yeah, and I, and I kind of associate them and a lot of the North Carolina bands with, with you know, hardworking DIY bands too. Oh yeah, as, totally. You know, and then of course, Merge became something so big because Mac and Laura worked so hard on it. And, and they picked the bands that they put on that label they were very smart i mean your first band one of your first bands palvo i mean that's great right you know you're doing right. pretty well there's number yeah. two so they you know and, and it's just gone on from there it's hugely impressive as a business like forget about the music like mm -hmm. that they built that into what it is is very that's crazy from it being nothing to what it is you know putting records in the top 10 in the billboard charts which seems insane to think about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, it's one of the, one of those things where I've never. I mean, I'm sure somebody has some gripe with them at some point, but I've never heard a major gripe about anything they do. Which is no, it's even fine. They they did it great. They did it the right way, as far as I can tell. I mean, even by sheer luck, most labels do something dumb at some point. Right. But I I haven't heard of the, anybody anybody saying that about them, which is no, no, no. impressive they too. Seem to have, yeah. they've, I mean, and, and they've, I mean, how they've broken countless acts since then, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. none of which I, I particularly care for, but, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, but I'm impressed with their industry. Yeah. And even when they're putting out a lot of stuff that I'm not that interested in, there always seems to be one or two things that they're behind that is yeah, that's, oh, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So as with the, our first episode with Who's Gonna Do, this is kind of a A-side heavy yeah. single <laughs> the the flip side is a, a cover of a british band called the flies who i'd never heard of no. even back even back when i heard this i didn't realize it was a a cover i would have thought it was the la flies but it was yeah and it's a i mean nothing against it it's not a, not a bad song per se but it's sort of generic super chunk which is a little weird to say because there hadn't been that much super chunk at this point but it you know in in, in the context of the songs they were doing not only Slack Motherfucker, but the songs that would end up on the first record and the and the and the, the next subsequent records. It's not it's not a standout by any means. But it, it does kind of make sure that they can't play the other side. <laughs> like nobody will play the other side on the radio, like try to right. sub it out. Uh -huh. It's the sub, Slack Motherfucker is the song on that record. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Slack Motherfucker just has a, not beyond the, beyond the kind of great lyrics and the great catharsis of it has a, has a bit of a, like an interesting swing to it that Night Creatures just is sort of a, a little bit of a plod, not in a bad, necessarily bad way. It's solid. 
but I just don't, it doesn't seem to have that. Like, I, I don't want to listen to it over and over. Like, I, I think they, it took them a minute. I mean, Psych Motherfucker is just such a great song. It overcomes it. But like the first record, I thought they took them a while to really to find that groove because they tended to be somewhat undynamic in the beginning to my ears, just kind of like grinding along with that particular sound. Sure. And unless they had a really incredible song, it just sort of made everything sound the same. But then mm-hmm. I think probably John, who was the drummer that got in at that time? Like he definitely a better drummer than John, John Worcester. Yeah, he's definitely. Yeah, yeah that's right. John Worcester. Worcester I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't sure if there was somebody who went between him and I think Joe. he was right after Chuck. I think, he uh, was. but yeah. they, he, he's a great drummer, of course, and he swings like mad. And so it gave the band a little bit better sound right away. Uh, having somebody, obviously who thinks musically behind the drums too, immediately gave him a boost. And I think other records after that were all better and better for a while. Absolutely. Like I, I, I definitely would say their first like three to four albums are, are an incline all the way. And if the first, I still think the first album is quite good, but, but the second one, which is uh, no Pocky for Kitty. Exactly. It's a great record too. And yeah, I like that one too. I think it's, it doesn't sound great, but I, I like that record. It's they got better songs and stuff like that. I think they did a really smart job of taking taking their sound and and expanding it without i mean because i think they're the kind of band that you wouldn't want to stretch really far but they figured out figured out how to find something new in it for a couple you know quite a few subsequent albums yeah oh totally it's funny with them because i when i first came out with the high the highness of max voice and the, the po going on stage and everything i thought so this is kind of dependent on them being young yeah but they managed to grow old and still pull it off Right. He still sounds the same. It's a distinctive voice, you know, like, and he's good. He knows how to sing. So, so this is interesting. You know, I, this is one of those records that I'd be curious. I don't, I don't think we can ask this question because we're, we're not these people, but I'd be curious to know <laughs> what, what people who weren't around for it, how many people know it, like either later Super Chunk fans or later Merge fans, or just, you know, indie rock people who, who grew up like in the 2000s or 20. I, I wonder, I don't know if this, this record has any legacy beyond like the staying power it's interesting because we're talking about we were we've the this was a sensation the single when it came out like 100 yeah. in the in the scene such as it was or wherever you bought seven inches or the independent college radio scene it was a people went nuts over it and mm-hmm. and it's it was another in a line of those kind of singles that this happened with and it launched Merge and it played mm-hmm. a role in launching Matador just based mm-hmm. on the strength of that. Just people screaming slack motherfucker <laughs> right. over and over again <laughs> yeah. over these screeching guitars, you know, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. kind of like touch me. I'm sick in that way. It's mm-hmm. and it's all that makes it sort of in a way very much like a lot of classic like 60s singles where it's, you know, there's a lot to be said for not stepping on the hook, like just get out of the way, like don't complicate things. But that's pop music songwriting 101. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, don't, don't necessarily, like, sometimes it's fun to withhold and make little puzzles. But really, if you want pop music, if you want people to relate, it's got to hit them in the chops and right. you got to keep hitting them in the chops and leave it there, you know, and then hit them some more. And so that's, that's what's great about a song like Slack Motherfucker or, or Touch Me I'm Sick, that they know they're smart enough to keep it dumb right yeah and i think we've talked about maybe talked about at one point before that this song sort of tells you what it's going to do right away and does it yeah right you know <laughs> which i mean it, it sounds easier than it is to, to to do you have to have you have to have the hook yeah you've got to have the thing that that people will want to listen to 10 million times over and over again and that's uh-huh you know that's not you got to know when you have that uh-huh i guess that's the the brains of the whole thing is being like okay that's that's the thing yeah. and it's, it's a good song because it's like it, they it just maintains its energy through the whole thing it sustains it doesn't build it's not dynamic particularly it just kind of gets to where it's going and stays there and keeps hitting that that button yeah and I, I don't know i may be off on this a little bit but i feel like also if it if i mean the, the band's sort of energy and earnestness about it and the way they the way it's kind of full throttle it avoids it from it could have it could have easily been sort of a a kind of indie novelty, like a take the skinheads bowling or a bitch and Camaro or something with ooh, I mean, it kind of was fun. in its yeah. way. If you think about it, I mean, not in a bad way, but you know, yeah. I mean, having that, that having the word motherfucker in there, with right. a song that's so catchy immediately mm-hmm. it puts it into something like a novelty. 
Uh-huh. But I mean, I don't think that's a criticism. Like that's no. okay. You know what I mean? Like, like, it, like I said, it's like a pop. It's a classic sort of pop song, but it can't mm-hmm. be played on the radio. It can't right. be played, uh-huh. but it's still a classic pop song in almost every, even the surprise of the word motherfucker showing up in the, in the chorus mm-hmm. uh, is a pop move. That juxtaposition is classic. Mm-hmm. You know? Nowadays, yeah. you just beep it. <laughs> right, right. Maybe. Yeah, or maybe you'd even be it. able to just, you probably even be able to just play it. Yeah. And, and, uh, but, yeah, those days that that definitely consigns you to, uh, you know, you aren't going to get any stray FM radio play with that sucker like you might with Smells Like Teen Spirit or something right. like. So it's kind yeah. of a miracle that it became the hit it did. And this was a time period where you could you could put a seven inch out and even not get radio play and still sell it because there were big sections of seven inches in the record stores and right people, and people were like into the idea of i'd rather buy a seven inch than an album not just because it's cheaper but people i think people had more fun listening to seven inches and albums at some points i mean at the time you know it was almost like back to london in the 60s a seven inch could make or break your career mm-hmm. yeah you know? and it yeah. literally like it happened that way you know you put out your seven inch Inch got picked up by everybody and written about everybody. You were probably going to make a couple of records for somebody. Yeah, and that's and, I mean it absolutely how it happened with this one. So it's kind of interesting that it was still happening. Like I hadn't really thought about it like that, like how close it was to those old like independent A and R um, deals where you know you find an artist, you put the artist in the song in the studio, whip it out. Like that song was recorded in January and was out within weeks. And that's the that's the same sort of concept of you know Louie Louie, where they you know put multiple bands in the studio within a week, we're all recording that song to see who could get a hit with it. Yeah, I mean it's weird weirdly the 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 factory ish uh, thing of the sixties and the DIY ish thing of the eighties and nineties kind of got to the same place from different directions. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. And, and so the radio scene was dependent on, on that stuff. So, but yeah, I think, I think it's an, it's an awesome record and, and one of the, one of the best ones of the time period for sure. And I'm, I am curious, like, yeah, it has it had, I mean, first of all, I think part of it is it, it might've gotten buried in that they've had other, but they've had other hits yeah. since then that, yeah. Um, might have eclipsed that, but right. I'd be curious to see. Yeah, do people remember mm-hmm. that song the way they yeah. remember? It's funny too. I think they they pretty quickly merged into merged. Sorry, into a band that like <laughs> like a sort of a Yola Tango style band where the albums are are the thing now with them, and that 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 happened pretty quickly. Yeah, and the mm-hmm. consistency, consistency of mm-hmm. sound, consistency of quality, probably right. Right. I, d- I doubt that there's many people stuck with them this long to think of them as a singles band, even though, I mean, the, this wasn't their only good single. They were, in the, for the first few years, there were like five or six pretty good seven inches. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, but the one with the Sebado covers. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That singles compilation is actually my favorite early thing by them by far. But yeah, it's excellent. It's really good. But... They did put a lot like people were putting out a lot of set. If you had the chance to put out a seven and she put out like eight. <laughs> right some right. of these bands yeah that's true that's true but so and thanks everybody for listening and we will see you on the next episode of the spindle goodbye the spindle is produced by john howard and me mark masters i'm also the audio editor our theme song is by the great band honey radar Our podcast is brought to you by Wasteoids, audio and video from Hello Merch. Find more podcasts and videos at wasteoids.com. And please leave a rating and a review of our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Thanks.